married, I was married, to a man who became extremely successful. And as I watched him rise, I noticed two things. He worked very hard, much harder than your average bear. And he said no a lot. He said no to people who wanted his time and attention and energy. He said no in a way that protected his resources so that he could channel them toward his own goals. And I realized that behind every no is a deeper yes to whatever it is that you do want. No is like a bright line that, when used properly, marks off where you end and others begin. And we learn this young. I have kids, and when they want to assert their power and individuality, they say no, no. But when you lose your deep yes, you also lose your bright no. How can you say no to protect what you want if you don't even know what you want? And I started to wonder if maybe the reason I had trouble saying no to people was because I did not think that I was worth a yes to protect. Let's do it. Hey, man. Shout out to Justine Musk, man, for the motivational intro to the episode. And shout out to the new subscribers. Salute to y'all, man. Thank y'all for tuning in. Thank y'all for watching the Candace Owens episode. We got over 100 new subscribers off of that episode. And we're going to talk about her again on this episode, too, also. Because I don't know if she got fired, she was released, or whatever. But her job was in... Hmm, She's done with the Daily Wire. And she had made a run on the Breakfast Club and all of those other platforms after we did the episode about her on Joe Budden platform. But I got a lot to talk talk to y'all about, man. We're going to talk about some intellectual things. Like I was listening to a lot of intellectual black people, a lot of authors, a lot of scientists, a lot of people that gave their perspective on the current climate of the country for people that look like me, like. When I did that podcast about Candace Owens also, a lot of people were offended that I was talking about, well, in the comment section. I shouldn't have been reading them anyway. But in the comment section, people was offended about me talking about the LGBTQ community, the transgender community. And it wasn't that I was being disrespectful to them. I was talking about them. But when you talk about certain things, people, you have the right to be offended. But You don't have the right to be offended with me being concerned with my own people. I have the right to be concerned with my own people. I love myself first, like she was saying in the intro. Man, sometimes you got to tell people no. No. People will use you until they use you up. And no. I got to internalize some of this energy for me. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about picking sides on this episode. And me, I like to remain neutral. At the end of the day, I'm more of a neutral individual. I just don't like picking the size. I like to keep myself empowered to make the decisions that I want to make for myself. But it's a lot of things. It's a lot of benefits and it's a lot of things that can go bad when you pick a side. And the reason I named the podcast Big Me, don't let nobody force you to pick a side is because of the future release. Future released his new album with Metro Boomin. I got to say it's fire. We don't trust you. I felt some tension brewing between him and Drake before this was even released. And we're going to play some records off of that also. This is not going to be a monetized show. We're going to talk about a lot of things politically. And we're just going to have a good time, man. Thank y'all for tuning in. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel. And let's get right to it. Let's get right to it. I'm going to start the conversation off with the future album and uh, the intro to the album. I'm going to play a little piece of the intro to the album. And when you hear this intro, you can feel and you can tell that it's tension. Somewhere in future's life is tension. Hatred all over you. Hatred all over you. Hatred all over you. Hatred all over you. Hate ran all over you, fake ran all over you, hate ran all over you. Smiling faces, sometimes pretend to be your friend. Smiling faces, show no traces of the evil that hurts within. Fake ran all over you, hate ran all over you, fake ran all over you. Been on the coast, cuffin' my 
my toes, but I still stuck to the cold. Money won't fold, pockets won't hold enough. Taking my pole and out, effing in and out. Take me anywhere, I'm taking over the trap. I see the real club with Grand Cartier. Popping the real pill, higher than Beverly Hills. I got too much pill, I give a bitch chills. Took out a spot. So, it's written all over your face. Basically, that's basically what he's saying. It's written all over your face. And we don't trust you. Now, he ain't lyrically killing nothing, bodying nothing in there, but I could just tell by the energy and the production. Shout out to Metro Boomer for the production, but we're talking about pick a side. Now, I'm going to play and I'm going to break down my perception of the song with Kendrick Lamar like that. And we're just going to talk about the lyrics and the things that stuck out to me. Now, the first person shooter song with J. Cole and Drake, we're going to take it back. We're going to take it back. I'm not going to play it. I know if y'all been intertwined with this conversation, y'all have checked it out for yourself and went back and listened to the, the lyrics. J. Cole, he doesn't seem like a, a beef orientated person. He doesn't seem like he wants conflict. These guys, these big three or whatever they want to call themselves, guys, they've been sending subliminal shots at each other for a long time. They've been talking about collaborating for a long time. Cole and Kendrick, they never collaborated. Drake and Cole, they collaborate all the time, but not on the whole body of work. And in that first person shooter song, I could hear the shots clear. I could hear the shots clear. I was just listening to it as a listener who's enjoying music. But I could tell that Cole was shooting shots at Kendrick Lamar. Drake was shooting shots at Kendrick Lamar. And they woke, they woke him up out of, out of his casket, man. He was asleep, but they woke him up. And he had some things to say. But picking a side now, the person who is most interesting in this beef to me is 21 Savage. He's going to have to pick a side. Now, the reason that Metro Boomin and Future and all the Future's involved probably because of female situations, because listening to the lyrics, it's, it's a lot of female oriented bars in there. But Metro Boomin, when Drake and 21 collabed, Metro Boomin sent a beat over. 21, that's 21's biggest collaborator. That's his homeboy. He got the heat. He basically curated, curated 21 Savage whole career. So on the collaboration with Drake and 21, Drake dissed Metro Boomin on his own beat. That was disrespectful, dog. Sending subliminal shots on my own beat. That's disrespectful. So they've been going back and forth lately. But when you think about 21's first single, X, it was with Future. When you think about 21's whole career, Production-wise, it was with Metro Boomin. So he's intertwined with 21 Future and Drake. Whose side is he going to go on when this beef ignite the way it's igniting? To me, just by looking at it, my perception, I would think that he's going to take Drake's side. And man, oh man, I'm not going to tell y'all what I think about that, but what do y'all think about that? Now let's play the record. I know what everybody here for, man. The record. Like that. Let's go. Gotta buy my joint up on this bitch. I miss you, I miss you, I miss you. Two times. Yeah. Sticking to the code, all these hoes for the street. I put it in her nose, it's gon' make her pussy leak. Pussy niggas told, ain't gon' wake up at they sleep. You can't hear that switch, but you can't hear them niggas scream. All my hoes do shrooms, nigga, all my hoes do coke. 20 carat ring, I put my fingers down her throat. If I lose a carrot, she might choke. I know she gon' swallow, she'll go. Free band, nigga, bring the rats in. Got the shooters in the corner, like the pack in. She think cause she was out of bitch, she attract, yeah. That's that shit that get you put up at the station. And the model still the same. Fall like I won a championship brain. You know these hoes hungry, they gon' fuck for a name. I put her on the game, she get fucked for a chain. 
Got your girl in this bitch, you twirling on the dick. I got syrup in this bitch, turn up in this bitch. Before, before, I'm a, I am gotta give Metro his pops, props. That song is sampled by three different individuals. I can hear him. He was once a thug from around the way. That's easy, e, easy does it. I can hear that bass line. Mm-mm. That's three six, tired the club up thugs. The beat in totality, I forgot the name of that group, that old school group, but it's an old school soul sample. And Metro just finessed it and put it together something ridiculously. And, and the song, the beat, the production is lit already to me. I don't know what y'all thoughts is yet, but to me, that production crazy. Let's listen to it, though. In this bitch, you murked in this bitch All these pointers on me, baby, you know it's game time Spring with friends, bitch, we fuck them at the same time I'm a different nigga, no, we not the same kind You can have that look, bitch, you ain't mine yeah. Young dope, dealer selling dope, bitch, you like that Kicking doors, kicking in doors, bitch, you like that Young dope, nigga selling lows, bitch, you like that All 24, you won't go, bitch, you like that Niggas from the bottom really like that Steppin' in balances if you like that. If you like that. Pop another bottle if you like that. If you like that. These niggas talking out of their neck. Don't pull no coughing out of your mouth. I'm way too paranoid for a threat. Hey, hey, let's get it, bro. DOT, the money, power, respect. The last one is better. Say yes, a lot of goofies with a check. I mean. Now, him saying I'm too paranoid for a threat is a warning to let you know. Don't threaten me, it's on. I'm, I'm too nervous. I'm from L.A. I got to keep my head on a swivel in L.A. all day long. I'm too paranoid for a threat. Now, don't be threatening me. Make it straightforward or I'm going to have to go to work now. Now, come on now, Kendrick, warming it up. Let's, let's listen to some more. Oh, I hold them sentiments symbolic. Oh, my temperament bipolar, I choose violence. Okay, let's get it up. It's time for him to prove that he's a problem. Niggas clicking up, but pay not be legit. No 40 water, tell him. Oh. Yeah, yeah, get up with me. Fuck sneak this and first person shooter. I hope they came with three switches. I crash out like fuck rap. This melly melt if I had two. Got two T's with me. I'm snatching chains and burning tattoos. It's up. Lost too many soldiers not to play it safe. If he walk around with that stick, it ain't Andre 3K. Think I won't drop the location. I still got PTSD. Motherfuck the big three. Nigga, it's just big me. Nigga, boom. What? I'm really like that. And your best work is a light pack. Nigga, Prince outlived my jack. Nigga, boom. Let me stop for a second because some people will perceive that this is light because they ain't catching it. Now, he said niggas clicking up no 40 water or be legit. Most folks might be too young to even know what he talking about. He talking about Cole and Drake clicking up, but they ain't 40 water or be legit. That album was fire, too, with that green uh, Chevelle on the front of it, the click. Ooh, that album was fire back in 93, 94. I was a young whippersnapper when that album came out, though. But he he put those bars in there, that double entendre. Then he was talking about a few more things in there that really, really caught my attention about. He's saying them niggas is, we don't need no sneak dissing. Say what you got to say. I'm, I'm Like, they've been throwing shots at each other for so long. I'm ready for the full song. Who is not going to give a verse and throw subliminals on somebody else's record? Who going to do the full song? And it's interesting that Future didn't diss nobody on this song, but Kendrick Lamar is dissing somebody who he collaborated with on his own album. It's kind of spooky. For all your dogs getting buried, that's a K with all these nines. He gonna see Pet Cemetery, nigga. Hey, I'm going to tell y'all how disrespectful that is. 
that that breakdown of that beat go on 54 more seconds. All my people that create bars, rappers, or producers or anybody know that he left that ending on there like that. Because if you want to snip the beat and think that you're capable of killing it harder than we killed it, here, here you go, a piece of it. Now make it happen. Do what you do with it. Now we're going to get into the podcast. I like that. I just like when hip hop is in a place where the top artists or whatever is having a feud and they got to say some things and they putting their bars together. We're going to play some more music off of the, the album or whatever, but bef- we got to get on into the podcast, into the conversation because I don't want to be here too long on the show. Pick a side, right? Make a choice, make a decision. And life, sometimes things be hard, man. We have to remove ourselves from people, from things, from circumstances, no matter the outcome. And the decision that you make can have an effect on your life in a positive way or a negative way. Now, Mace was on, it was, it is what it is podcast with his boy Cameron. They was talking, right? And he was asked a question that I think that, like, not just artists need to hear this, but people in general in life that has a choice to make right now. You'll know it then. Did you make the right decision leaving rap? I did. Everything now that we see playing out was all the things I escaped. The car, the, the shine, the loom. The Puff Daddy, Craig every, Mac. the Craig Mack, Biggie Smalls, the Biggie Smalls. So even though I made those decisions and it cost me money, that's why I got with Killer and they gave me the money back. I didn't lose no money. It's destiny. <laughs> that boy good. That boy good. <laughs> that boy good. That boy good. That boy good. That boy good. And that's why he makes the big bucks. That's why he makes <laughs> big the big bucks. <laughs> that, that was crazy. Yeah, I couldn't have planned that. You asked me. See, that's why it's destiny. You asked me the right question, and we at the right place. This is how it's meant to go, man. That's what I do, baby. <laughs> thank you, like Killer. Yeah, likewise. Thank man. you, Killer. Man, thank you. On man. national TV. Yeah. Thank you, Killer. Yeah, thank- Salute to them boys. Salute to making that smart decision, though, Mace. Like, to me, I think. I think that. That was a smart decision, first of all, from Mace removing himself because. Not just being a bunch of Diddy or not just rap, not just artists or whatever. Like everybody deals with choices on a daily basis. I even got choices that I need to make right now myself. And I'm scared to go one way or the other. But in relationships, if it's stagnant and you don't see a future that's positive for you, you got to go. Real talk, you got to go. Some people will want to stay in a certain realm or in a certain area in life or they want to remain the same and they won't want to evolve in life and you see your life going a different direction. You got to go. You got to make that choice. It might hurt. You might be broke. You might lose money. You might lose loved ones, friends, family, anything. But you got to go. You got to make that decision. You got to pick a side. And me, at the beginning of the podcast, I said I'm neutral. But you got to pick a side. Now, I salute Mace for that, though. A lot of people say he was a fake pastor. He was fake this. He was fake that. Man, that man chose to do something different than what he's seen. As this bad boy and Diddy situation unfold, Mace is starting to look like a genius. They named some people on there. They didn't name G. Depp, who caught the murder charge. They didn't name how people, man, they didn't name some people. I don't even want to name the people, but they didn't name some some people. And 
it, he looks like he a genius. He left. He removed himself after two albums. He might have complained about money here and there, though, but he did what he had to do to get about that situation, and I salute that. Now, he had a choice to make, and, and, and we all got choices to make, but I want to talk about something else, too, though, like in our community, gang culture, going to Los Angeles. People be telling me, Trev, you going to go to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles? I don't even eat meat. You going to go see this such and such in the hood? You going to go to Crenshaw and take a picture in front of Nipsey Mural? I don't have no intentions of wanting to go to the hood, man. I don't even know why people, like, once you make it out or once you become successful, go back to assist the people that you love or uh, or try to help people change their mind and get to a different frequency where they, they vibrating on a different frequency, but you don't have no business being there no more because people going to envy you or want to hurt you or want to kill you, dog. And that ain't, that ain't the type of time that I'm on. So Schoolboy Q was on Drink Champs today. I just got this clip today because it was interesting to me when I went out to L.A. Uh, I done been to L.A. every year in the last three, four years. L.A. is a different place, different pace. You could it could be palm trees, ocean breeze, beautiful one street, and then the next street it could be graffiti and crime. Uh, right there, like thirty seconds away from each other, and twenty dudes on the block, and it's like that every corner. You be in Beverly Hills, boom, you turn this corner, you're right here in gang territory. You know what I mean? I heard uh, a artist, Vince Staples, talking about you can't order Uber Eats in L.A. because it might be four niggas in a car with your address, remembering your address, dropping off your Uber Eats and your and you open up your bag, it smell like weed. You know what I mean? It's just not safe in LA. And you gotta know how to move and know how to protect yourself when you out there. But schoolboy Q was on Drink Champs and he had this to say to the artists and the people that wants to visit LA. The rumors that LA is probably one of the most dangerous places for rappers. Do you believe that's true? Um, yeah. Wow. Because, I mean, everybody be checking in. That's your favorite thing to do. Check in with somebody that's going to rob your stupid ass. Right. Like, mm. Wow. Yo, you think that guy, he, yo, the guy that you don't know, motherfucker, in uh, California got your back? The guy that got beef with other hoods and all this, you checking in to that dude? Right. Bro, just go to the hotel. Get you something to eat. <laughs> go back to the hotel. Do your business. <laughs> go have some fun. Right. Where this shit is fun. Where are you? Why do you want to go over there? All right. For what? All Don't right. call me. Right. Oh, so motherfuckers be having a nerve to call me sometime. Like, right. <laughs> like, like, what are you talking about, bro? I'm playing video games. My daughter got a soccer game tomorrow, bro. Grow the fuck up. Like, I'm not about to drive over here to Beverly Hills and drop you off an ounce a week. You know, when I think of checking in, I think of extortion. I think of nobody's going to look out for my best interest more than me. I think that it's foolishness. I think that we should be not trying to harm each other. I think gang culture is foolishness, to be honest with you. I think that people will be stronger if they unify. But who am I to tell people what to do and what to choose? But at the end of the day, you got to pick a side and make a smart decision. Me, when I visit L.A., I'm not telling nobody. I'm not going nowhere where it's crime. I'm not going anywhere where the foolishness is going on. And if I do, I got a sixth sense. I've been in the streets. Man, I was in the streets for (laughs) 27, 28 years of my life. I don't want to go back, but I can feel it. I can feel the tension. I can feel when people are disgruntled and I could just feel it when I'm in the presence of it and I remove myself from it. That ain't the type of environment I want to be in. And checking in is crazy. Even somebody from L.A. even said that just now. The people that you checking in with got problems with somebody down the street. Why you expect them to take care of you better than you could take care of yourself? You saying something about yourself. Real talk. Now. I want to talk about hip hop. Uh, having rules, regulations, you can't do this, you too old now, 
Your jeans ain't tight enough. Your swag ain't this. You're 28 years old. Why you ain't retired yet? You ain't made a billion dollars by the time you're 40. Why you still rapping? Why you still doing this? Why you still doing that? We the only genre of music where people limit us and tell us what we can and can't do and who is and who isn't going to support us based upon the rules and regulations of hip hop. In the streets, the black culture is the only culture that promotes snitching like that. When in our reality, snitching and drive-bys and all those type of activities was created by the Italians and the mob. You don't hear them talking about this stuff like that. It's so many rules and regulations that we have to hinder ourselves instead of uplifting ourselves. That is crazy. And I heard DJ Paul talking about that on Willie D podcast and the reason I pull up clips most of the time having celebrities say things is because if I say the things you know what I mean people will be like Trev you tripping but when they hear it from a celebrity they accept it as the gospel the music because music can be controlled by something as small as something as small as the young kids don't like this sound no more mm -hmm. <laughs> Or they don't like this style of clothes no more. This or that. It's a bunch of rules in, in hip-hop music. I say hip-hop music. I ain't, I ain't going to say that in no other music. Because like, it ain't like that in country or you know, right. EDM or pop or something. You know what I'm saying? But with hip-hop music, you know what I'm saying? Like Hip-hop music, they can, they can stop listening to you just because you're over 28 years old or something. You right. never know with these little motherfuckers. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? But meanwhile, you can have like a group like, um, what's my boy name? Daft Punk. I think they like close, creeping up to 60 or something. They definitely in their 50s. Uh, Rolling they, Stones who were in their 70s. Yeah. <laughs> Still touring and selling out. Yeah. But the reason why I use Daft Punk as an example because, you know, they wear the mask and I don't know how they look. They still make new music. Okay. They still make new hits. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, all of us can tour for the rest of our life off these old songs, but still being able to put out new music is a different thing. And I still put out new music that people like. Matter of fact, my Spotify uh, monthly listeners went up, you know, in the last few years. I only had like 140,000 monthly listeners probably like three years ago, a year and a half ago, I think it was. Yeah, like two, year and a half. And, um... Well, probably like two years. And now, you know, I stay, I float around three million monthly listeners. So, yeah. you know, so my mind, is, that's the reason why I can't sleep, because it's always trying to think of a way to improve everything that I do. The Traylon Jackson Podcast. That's a beautiful thing that that brother is trying to improve the things that he do. And it's a beautiful thing that other cultures and other genres of music are also allowed to continue on. What's preventing us from continuing on? You're never too old to create. Don't let somebody tell you that you're too old to create. You're too old to make music. You're too old for a podcast. You're too old to be an actor. When Samuel L. Jackson and boys didn't get on till they was 43, 44 years old. Like age is a number. Life is meant to be lived and enjoyed and have experiences. Now, I'm going to finish up uh, my hip hop segment of this podcast before I get into the intellectual individuals conversation, because I want to talk about some people. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk about the Democratic Party. I want to talk about Joe Biden and. Kamala Harris and just the Democratic Party as a whole involving celebrities, entertainers, rappers, actors, athletes and their process of getting reelected or getting elected. They use people that are famous to get their fan base so they can have leverage when it's Voting time. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, well, right, Joe. But yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, Glow. <laughs> yeah, Joe. Yeah, well, right, Joe. But yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, Glow. 
He ain't even know her name, man. Salute to Glorilla, though. I think that I like some of Glorilla music. I'm from Tennessee. I can't help it. Like, if you from my hometown and you hating on Glorilla, then you don't even like your own people because she remind me of the people that I grew up with. She remind me of the women in my community. She remind me of the music that I grew up listening to in the 90s, 3-6 Mafia, 8-Ball MJG coming out hard, Tila, Peace of Mind. You know what I mean? It, it, it's just Skinny Pimp, King of the Players Ball, Project Pat, Getty Green. She remind me of that. So I like her creatively, artistically, and musically. And she has the right to go to the, the White House, man, and, and meet the president. I've been to the White House before, twice. I visited as a grown-up, and I went as a safety patrol in elementary school. <laughs> yeah. But one thing I want to say before I talk about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris is that I'm for every president. I want them all to succeed. I want them all to win. I don't want them to fail. This is the country that I was that I grew up in, that I was born and raised in. I want them to win. I want the the presidents to win. I want them to succeed. I want them to consider the people of the country. I want them to consider the their base, their voters, the people that supports them. I want that, but I don't like pandering. I don't like when you play people and you 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 like you playing with people's ignorance. You know these people don't know what's going on and you playing with them. That's not right to me. So after Glorilla went to the White House, she went on CNN, and I find this funny. And she had something to say about going to the White House. The The person, the host of the show, asked her what was her experience like, and she had a crazy response. But why was she on CNN in the first place? Of an artist you are, how many accolades and nominations and everything you've got going on, at least, at least with what you have planned for the summer coming ahead with um, a concert and a tour, the idea of them inviting you there in particular, um, did they talk to you about what they wanted politically? Did they want your endorsement? Did they want you to help people get out the vote? Hey, you know, they ain't got nothing to do with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just living my life like it's golden, living my life like it's golden. But, you know, I'm not going to, you know what I'm saying, talk politics, but I love the president. You know what I'm saying? I love everybody. And at the end of the day, the day got to end. At the end of the day, the day got to end. Glow, do not go on those places and, and buy ourselves from Tennessee no more. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Like, I salute. I love the creativity, the artistic, and the music and everything, though. But don't go on there and and do that because they trying to steal your fan base and the people that you got backing you and use that to get those people to support them. And I don't like that. And I'm not the only person that don't like pandering. Here's the thing. Anything, anything the politicians do around this time of year uh -huh. looks like pandering mm -hmm. because it is, it is. right. Mm -hmm. The White House's black outreach invites folks like Glorilla to events like that for moments exactly like that one. And Glorilla ain't the only person neither. Like they had, they had Chuck D from Public Enemy at the White House. Now, even on the Republican side, like Trump had. Black folks and stuff there though, but they don't do it in the same way that Democrats do it. I remember when Puff Puffy had the campaign "Vote or Die." He out there dancing and all that old type of stuff. "Vote or Die." That was kind of harsh for Barack Obama. And uh, when Beyonce and Jay Z was supporting Hillary Clinton, but she took that L. She took that L. Like what I want to say about that before I get to this other person. That's that's trying to make his mark in the political realm is that I don't like it. You know, it ain't about me. It ain't about what I like and I don't like, but I don't like that for real because people don't know what they involving themselves in. And y'all only care around election time. Now the three years 
with after you're elected. Let's talk about that. Your participation in helping the people who helped you get in office. Let's talk about that. Real talk. And some people may be like, Trev, we we only we ain't even voting that well, sorry for you. Like a lot of folks don't they be like, Trev, you done changed the topics of your podcast. You ain't on sports and certain things about hip hop and foolishness no more. It's because life real, dog. Life real. We got to talk about the real shit that's going on. The real stuff that's affecting people. And the misconception of the entertainment industry, the, the foolishness that's going on. Like, the fool, it's, it's, it's too much foolishness for me. And I just want to make people aware, man, that come from the impoverished backgrounds like me. I just want us all to evolve. Now, I'm going to talk about this other entertainer who met, sat down with Kamala Harris to talk about reforming marijuana charges and bills and all of that. And he also talked about health care. Given that, are you optimistic coming out of the address last night that at least that portion will be met? Well, I know that's what I was doing there, going for health care transparency. Over 100 million Americans are in debt due to uh, hospital uh, prices. And so I was over there and I was mingling with everybody. So, I, you know, I'm a diehard Democrat, but I snuck in the speaker's gala first because I had to deal with the Republicans. I'm, I'm trying to bring this law through bipartisan. Mm-hmm. So I went up in there, snuck in. He saw me, he said, Fat Joe. He told his wife, yo, I got street cred. Fat Joe came to check me. Then they had an incredible spread of food and in true uh, fashion, I was the first to eat the food there. And then I talked to everybody about health care transparency on the Republican side. Then I went to see Hakeem Jeffries, mm-hmm. hung out over there, saw their spread up too, you know, and just hung out with everybody over there and just bringing awareness that America's in a big crisis. You know, a lot of people are losing their homes, losing everything they got due to health care prices. And so that's why I was in there. Fat Joe be with the foolishness for for so long. And the spread. Is that what he just said? You talking about health care to this woman. But then you talk about the spread in the Democratic section. Then you said you left over there and tore up the spread on the Republican side. But you're concerned about people's health care. But you're talking about eating up some shit. And them the people that they want us to listen to. I'm off at. I ain't got I ain't got <laughs> I ain't got nothing else to say. I ain't even got nothing else to say. I'm gonna play a song off of my album. It was all a dream, man. If you enjoy this record, go check it out, man. I'm gonna post a link at the bottom in the description. Let's go. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. I had to get me something. I came up from nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. I had to get me something. I came up from nothing. I had to change my mental, upgrade my credentials. How a nigga came up, it wasn't accidental. Now monumental, more like legendary A player never worry, bump and pop Hail Mary trapped off a Blackberry Ain't contrary to your belief I made it out them streets, don't acknowledge beef Kept the play discreet, we too unique On the winning streak, spent a couple racks at the boutique I wouldn't change nothing, I'm always me Never took a plea, nigga you a flea I'm your OG's OG He called me for inspiration Need a consultation, just make the payment For the conversation, if it's elevated or innovation, my expectation ain't limitation. You need a demonstration. My track record and reputation should be admiration. That's confirmation. I'm decoration for the trenches. Off 
off the benches. Jump the fences, no penny pension. We off the hinges. Hit the shot, my team winning. The series clinching, you niggas finished. Never timid, I've been a menace. No old dog, and every day is printed. Haters living, cause my life changed. Should be happy, but you a real lame. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. I had to get me something. I came up from nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change nothing. I had to get me something. I came up from nothing. What's poppin', what's poppin', man? I hope y'all enjoyed that record, man. I wouldn't change nothing. So, I'm gonna get off the hip-hop conversation topics and, and, and talk about the Candace Owens release or her being removed or her being fired or whatever happened. She announced that she would be parting ways with the Daily Wire on her Instagram. And people were assuming, like, how did it come to this, like, How did it get to this point? And people was playing videos and creating videos of what got her fired because everybody assumed that she got fired. And I made a clip of the video and I want to know y'all perception. Is this why she got fired? Because she was talking about Israel and Hamas and the Jews and all of that old type of stuff. And I want to say something about. Israel and the Jews too, because I'm a person that loves all human beings, but I'm concerned about my own people. Now, Vladimir Putin just put out images and stuff that Jesus was black. He confirmed what the Hebrew Israelites been saying for years. He confirmed it. He went to his archives of some pieces and items that he has in the Russian museum. And he pulled them out. Now, no disrespect to the Jews or the people of Israel. It's all over the internet that they found oil in the Gaza Strip. And they want to use that oil to benefit their country. And that's why the war is existing. I don't know. I'm assuming that. I'm assuming that. I'm going to just tell y'all that right now. I don't like war. I don't like to see innocent people die that doesn't benefit or have nothing to do with the war. And I don't like being lied to. I don't like at the end of the day when people try to control the narrative, control the messaging, control what people have to say. Freedom of speech. That's not healthy because you don't want nothing but a good perception out about yourself. And you don't want other people to speak about what you do and you don't even apologize about the bad things that you do because you don't want that apology to be used in a court of law. I don't have nothing against nobody. But I'm aware. I'm going to be honest with you because everybody's noticing it. Every single political commentator in America, every single one of them knows this, that if you do not step out and say things that are radically pro-Israel, or if you are too quiet on certain narratives and they want you to be radically pro-Israel, you can lose everything. That's truth. That is a fact. I'm not, I'm not feeling like I need to hide from that anymore because, or be afraid to say it rather is a better way to say it because I've endured this for years. I'm just at the end of my rope. I I have given so much rope here and I am just done with it. Now, she's out of a position at the Daily Wire, but I assume that she wanted to be out of that job. She didn't want to be there in the first place. That's just my my perception. And when I think about some things that Kanye had said on the Drink Champs, that wasn't a lie. It might have been offensive, but it wasn't a lie. And the next day, he lost $1.5 billion for speaking about something that wasn't a lie. That let me know who's in power and who's controlling things. And I don't have nothing against nobody. 
but I'm aware. And I ain't attempting to pick a side, but I'm aware. Now, after, before, let me correct myself, before the Candace Owens firing or whatever, or however she terminated her contract with those people, she was on The Breakfast Club. She spoke about Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire, and she said that they can't fire her. Then the next day she was gone. But she, what, what went viral from that Breakfast Club episode was that people tend to marry based upon their IQ. That was hella interesting to me. I'm going to let y'all hear what she got to say, then we're going to talk about that for a moment. Now, I want to go back to something you said earlier, because I know a lot of people will hear you say, well, Candace, you're speaking a lot about, you know, the black family, but then you married a white man. Yeah, I'm Dr. Always- Umar would have a huge problem with that. <laughs> they wild. Okay, I would love to talk to him more about that because, I mean, it's it's always very interesting to me to hear this paradox of black people who will make an argument that, you know, the system is racist and then also make an argument like this, which is essentially making an argument for the Supreme Court to revisit Virginia versus love and basically say that black Americans and white Americans shouldn't be marrying. I think the greatest thing ever is when people come together on the basis of who they love and get married. You know, for me personally, I never thought of my husband as a race. This it's, is very interesting to me that two people go. She's she's married to a white man. I look at my kids. I'm not like, oh, my kids are mixed. I married the person that it made the most sense for me to marry. I have a mind that is just, you know, if you even knew half the things that I'm thinking about, the stuff that I'm reading, just go, 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 go all the time. It's it's difficult for me to find. It was difficult for me to find a partner that was a challenge to me, you know, the challenge mm-hmm. that I needed, um, whether you want to say like an academic challenge, whatever it is, with my same interests. Mm-hmm. It just was. Uh, what you will know, a lot of times people think that when people come together, it's because of how they look. Actually, I actually read this in a Thomas Sowell book, or maybe it was a Shelby Steele book. Uh, people tend to marry their IQ, which is interesting. Mm. You think like if you see two black people together, oh, it's because they are two black people, but actually they, they are probably better matched based on their IQ. Um, you know, I fell in love with my husband just because I think he is one of the most brilliant people ever. Now, people, I seen people on social media roasting her about that because she says people tend to marry based upon their IQ. And she was saying, so you're saying the people were saying, so you're saying that black men's IQ is too low for you. So you didn't marry a black man. Now, my perception, I don't think that's what she was saying. And I think IQ does play a part in a lifetime commitment with the individual. I don't think that it is the sole purpose of marriage. Now, me, my whole life before I've got married, I'm a married man myself now. My whole life, I've only been attracted to smart women that were smarter than me. I've never been attracted to idiotic women. You never see me with a stupid girl. S- sorry. I don't mean to like judge individuals or nothing, but I'm not the type of person to be attracted to people that vibrate on a lower frequency than me. That is, I, I'm not attracted to that. It's not nothing physical or the looks or none of that, even though I perceive that all the women that I've dated was beautiful. But I love black women. I love being an intelligent black woman. Like, if I wasn't a married man, Candace Owens would be attractive to me because she's smart. She's intelligent. She's a challenge. She's going to make me go research and go learn more and more and more. So, a lot of women that listen to this podcast, if y'all listening to this episode, because I know we've gained a lot of more female followers, and I salute y'all. Thank y'all for coming over here to this boys club, man. That uh, your looks, your breast, your wants. Your sex. That ain't what real real dudes want. Real dudes want an intelligent individual. We want a smart individual. And salute to Candace Owens for that, though. But if y'all listen to what she said at the end, she said she's been listening to a lot of Shelby Steele and Thomas Sowell. And she's been reading a lot of their books. So when I heard that, she she said that also, not just on The Breakfast Club, but she said that also on the Joe Budden podcast. I had already been listening to Thomas Sowell, but I never purchased one of his books. So 
I researched Shelby Steele and I started listening to some of his interviews and I purchased a couple of his books. I'm going to tell y'all what I purchased. I'm going to pull my audible up. If you're listening to the audio version on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, come on over to the YouTube and check out the visuals. But if y'all look, I purchased five books, man. It's my podcast right there, too. We on Audible also. Purchased five books from these brothers. So I'm going to tell y'all the title in case y'all want to hear it. I'll go read it. Dismantling America. The Economics of Politics and Race. Intellectuals and Race. Black Rednecks and White Liberals. Ethnic America. And then the last one, the one that I've read so far, and I'm going to play some clips. This is Thomas Sowell, A Conflict of Vision. Now, that book right there, I'm going to be honest with y'all. It, it, it's helping me evolve because I couldn't understand the terminology. So I started writing down words that was being said in the book and going to research the definition of what those words mean so I can understand it more when I read it a second time. So I purchased some books from Shelby Steele, hard copies. If I wasn't so far away from them, I'd go grab them from my, my bookshelf and show them to y'all. But White Guilt was one of them. And he was talking about this in an interview. Because when I read books, I listen to interviews of people talking about their book and all of that stuff. And he was talking about white guilt and accountability in the black community and accountability from blacks. And when I was listening to him speak, I was like, man, people will call him a coon if they heard him speak like that. People will call him an Uncle Tom if they heard him speak like that. But as I become more knowledgeable, I be more receptive to these type of conversations. And as blacks, we need to ask ourselves why we have become so dependent on this delusion that we live in a, a, a society that is intent on keeping us down. That's over with. It isn't that kind of, it's just over with. We need to face ourselves more frankly. You guys, as 75% of all black children born out of wedlock. You understand the kind of dysfunction, just that statistic alone. That's a problem. And now who's going to fix that? The government? Um, we, you know, we, there has to be, right now we have a, an identity as blacks that's victim focused. We're victims, which basically is designed to tap in the white guilt and get, the, get them to give us all kinds of little, basically, crumbs. And we're just sort of locked into that. And, we, uh, and, and there's no examination of how self-reliance, um, more personal responsibility for one's decisions in life, that these are the things that now determine our fate. And, and again, I, I blame a lot of this on the original oppression. We weren't, that was not an experience that taught us these things, these values and principles that other people take for granted. You know, before I got married, I used to wonder, like, what's the benefits of marriage and this and that? Like, raising a child when you're married, it's easier because you have two incomes, you have two minds, you have two hands, you have two people that's accessible to the child. You have their family. You have your family. You have more access to that. Now, marriage is beneficial. He said 75% of black children are created out of wedlock. So that means only one individual and the government has to assist you. That's not a successful way to raise a child. Not saying that people can't do it because I was raised like that. And I overcame. And I'm happy that I am where I am today. But that's not a successful way to do it. Now, we expect the government to fix things. We expect the government to take care of us. That's a form of slavery, to be honest, because you shouldn't expect assistance from the government. You, you're free now. Now, there's consequences to being freed also, because once you're free, you're responsible for your own well-being. You're responsible for 
evolving. You're responsible for your elevation. Nobody's going to be there. And then when nobody's there and, and you're not evolving, you become a victim. And that, that's sick, though. Back to your recent piece in the Wall Street Journal, Shelby. Quote, racism is endemic to the human condition just as stupidity is. We will always have to be on guard against it. But now, in the United States, it is recognized as a scourge. What has happened is that black America has been confronted with a new problem, the shock of freedom. Mm. Close quote. Mm -hmm. The shock of freedom as a problem. Explain that. Well, if you have been an oppressed people, and we were obviously truly oppressed for centuries, we learned all sorts of things in order to survive that. Um, I won't go into a long list, but, but we, we learned how to reinvent ourselves. We learned how to live with the, this, this oppression, with this sort of negative force in your life. We, we were, I think, miraculous. We created a great music out of this. We, we did other things in, that, were, that had a worldwide impact. We expanded the idea of democracy. Um, and made, it, made freedom an absolute. We did all those things. The one thing we never did, never had a chance to do, was to live in freedom. We were never free. We were always in a position of calculating our fate through those who dominated us. We were never just free to, do, to invent ourselves as we wanted to. Uh, and that, the fact that beginning in the 60s when we began to confront freedom, when America backed up and said, okay, well, discrimination is wrong, there are a bunch of laws to support that, <clears throat> uh, we're confronted. Well, what do you do with freedom? Uh, what are you going to do now? Uh, I, and historically, it scared the hell out of us. We would be fantasizing if we denied that who wouldn't be freedom is a frightening thing it it places such a burden of responsibility on you on the person who has it um you're now responsible your reputation is based now on what you do um well combined with that was the fact that four centuries of oppression had left us in many ways underdeveloped so when freedom comes freedom then says we're not oppressing you anymore. You're responsible for your underdevelopment. The Trevor Jackson Podcast. After that was said, the only thing I can say to y'all is you got to pick a side. You are responsible for your own development. Peace, love, plenty of abundance. Make sure you go get you some money, and I'm gone. Yeah. The Trevor Jackson Podcast.